Good morning, everyone. My name is David Pataru, and I'm here with Jody Daniels, founder and CEO of Red Clover Advisors. Jody Daniels um, is, is, uh, runs a privacy consultancy that brings data privacy strategy and compliance together with its flexible and scalable approach, which simplifies data privacy complexity, refines up and updates or builds privacy structure, and makes both the business and the legal issues accessible and, and actionable for all. Jody is a certified information privacy professional with 24 years of experience who serves as the outsourced privacy officer for companies helping a range of businesses from startup to Fortune 100 uh, create privacy programs, build customer trust, and achieve GDPR and U.S. privacy law compliance. Since launching in 2017, Red Clover Advisors has helped hundreds of companies create privacy programs and establish a secure online data strategy their customers can count on. Jody makes privacy easy to understand by breaking it down into measurable steps using plain language her clients can easily relate to. She's a national keynote speaker, a co-host of She Said Privacy, He Said Security podcast, has been featured in IPP, The Economist, Forbes Inc., Authority Magazine, ISACA, and many other publications. Jody holds a Master's of Business Administration, a Bachelor of Business Administration from Emory University. She passionately supports the idea that privacy is more than just compliance and concern over fines. It's a human right we all deserve. Jody has made it her mission to help businesses build trust and transparency with this core value at its foundation. She lives in Atlanta, Georgia with her husband, two girls, and a big, big fluffy dog named Basil. Jody, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Glad to be here. We're also here, we will be uh, talking about your new book, uh, Data Reimagined as well. And I have a copy here on my desk. And uh, it's such a pleasure to be able to talk to you about this book and also about trust. And um, when you decided to kind of jump into writing a book and the title Data Reimagined, what what does that mean or what 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 should that mean for our audience? I think so many people are focused on compliance and regulations. And th those are important. Those are good. Companies should follow laws. At the same time, companies are so focused on collecting as much data as possible. And they're thinking about, I want to collect as much as I can for, for me, the company, and how can I use it to sell more things? And what we're suggesting is that you can think about the data being collected and how can that benefit me, the individual? And the idea of flipping, putting the customer first, putting the customer in the middle. And the idea of data reimagining comes from how can you think about data differently, where it's not just about collect as much as possible. It's not only about complying with laws. It's collecting what is necessary to serve an amazing experience, fulfill on your product and service obligations or whatever it is that you're trying, your revenue generator to your customers and building that relationship. And we feel that the idea of reimagining data, how could you think about it in a different way to build a stronger connection with individuals? The more data I, Jody, give you the company, you're going to be able to tailor and customize to me. We hear a lot in marketing, it's going to be personalized in the AI universe. It's going to be tailored to me. Well, that's only if I give you accurate data. If I don't trust you, I'm not going to give accurate data, in which case you actually make bad decisions. No, that makes so much sense. And I think in your book where we kind of, you talk about that a little bit on page 22, where you say having information about your customers isn't the same as having a relationship with them. And you go on to say, in fact, it can have the opposite result. And, uh, you know, I've, I've noticed that myself where, you know, suddenly you might get an ad or something like that. And, and you're like, where did this come from? Or how do they know that I was looking at a lawnmower last week? And how does, uh, you know, one company know that uh, when I really had no relationship with them, and I'm getting ads from them. And I think that's uh, some of what you were talking about. Can you talk through um, that um, example at the beginning of your book, uh, which I think it's um, based on a uh, Christmas classic uh, where, um, you know, you have somebody kind of following you around, um, kind of marking down or um, capturing every move and everything that you're kind of doing just to kind of frame some of the issues that we're, we're discussing today. Absolutely. Well, when you think about going through your daily life, maybe it's grabbing a cup of coffee. David, you and I were talking about our coffee earlier this morning. Maybe we went out for our coffee and we needed to run some errands, drop some kids off at school, run to the gym, get lunch. 
where, where are we actually physically working right here? What we might be purchasing. If we had someone following behind us with a little notepad, marking every single activity that we were doing, what kind of coffee, what kind of lunch, what did we, where is our daycare and yoga studio and gym office, so on and so forth throughout the day, we would be really frustrated after about 30 seconds. We would turn around and say, why are you following me? Anyone ever walk down the sidewalk? You can kind of feel that presence. You might feel uncomfortable if there's someone a little too close to you. Well, imagine someone's literally writing everything down. Most people don't like that. Well, in the digital world, that's what we're doing. Many companies think just because I can, why not collect it? I might need it at some point. I'll just collect as much as I possibly am capable of doing, put it in a big pot, analyze it, come up with something interesting out of it, maybe not. And the idea is, if you think about that profiling, that following, that kind of creepy factor, you wouldn't tolerate it in the physical world. Because it's intangible in the digital world, we can't see it. We don't know. And I think if people better understood what was actually happening online, they might ask companies more about their data practices. They might reach out to lawmakers a little bit more. And so here I'm suggesting that companies think about the customer first and think about what is actually happening. Do they really need all of that data? Because I don't think that the regular individual knows enough and really would be happy with it. And all of us are consumers all day long. That's right. And I mean, uh, thinking about this, I know we we um, at the Mitigating Unauthorized Scraping Alliance, we're also dealing with companies, it's not just the data that they collect, but it's also the information that end users or users put online themselves to share information with their family members, to post pictures, to, um, um, to share that they're interested in maybe getting hired for a particular kind of job. And now we have a new challenge beyond just the over collection of data. We have uh, third parties that are coming along and scraping this data off of these, off of the websites and then repackaging them or reselling them. So how, in your opinion, has made kind of or degraded that trust, um, you know, trust um, uh, situation even more, whereas, you know, pe maybe people don't realize how much data is being collected. And now you have third parties that you don't have no relationship with that are collecting your data, repackaging it and selling it to other third parties you have no relationship with? I think you know, when I talk to people and they get emails that they've never heard of, they get flyers in the mail that they've never heard of. I got a text the other day that says, hi, Kevin. So somewhere, someone, and I've had this number a really, really, really long time. Someone out there has taken my number and, and attached it to Kevin and someone else bought that. I should have had some fun, but I decided, nope, I'm not going to reply to the potential bot and give them even more. There are people who understand or not understand, but there's people who are receiving this and they don't like it. They don't understand. They're questioning where did this information come from? You mentioned if you're going shopping and something is following you. Well, if I'm getting, perhaps I'm getting a coupon and you're not because of the data that's been purchased and how it's been collated together. The, I, that creepy factor, people aren't comfortable with that very formal, and I've heard executives say creepy factor. It's very formal. It's a good phrase. They don't like that. All of us here, we, we want to be able to help our company as best as we can. And at the same time, we don't really want our data to be shared with third parties in ways that we don't know and have no real control over for use in a manner that we also don't know and have no control over. There's the collection side and the use side and sharing all along the way. And most people aren't don't like that idea. They wouldn't just put their information in a big vacuum and hope it's all okay. And so that's what's happening from a scraping situation. I am seeing a shift in how some people are changing their behavior on some platforms. I'm seeing some people aren't putting as many photos as they might have before on social platforms, or they're putting less. They're being more cognizant of what they're putting out there. I, I do see a bit of a shift. It's not a seismic shift. It's, it's slowly moving there. And if you think about from a company perspective, if I get data from, I buy it from a third party, would I be okay if someone else then used the data from my company in my site? 
I think people need to look at both sides of the equation and make that determination. It might be good for me, but how would I feel if someone was taking our customer data and using it for themselves? Yeah, and what if there was disclosures about that? Um, they're saying, "Hey, you're 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 essentially uh, hard, you know using this scraped data, and um, and you know that wasn't authorized. The users didn't give any kind of consent, and you're using that to." Um, uh, in some way within your company? What does that look like if you're claiming to be privacy forward or um, respecting user privacy? I think uh, your, your your book is another great quote on page 23, and it says that companies that collect consumer data without permission are effectively stealing the currency of intimacy, creating resentment rather than relationships. And, um, I, you know, I, I definitely think that, you know, what you just said is is uh, reflects that in the sense that, um, you know, people are more reticent to share their data. Um, they're more reticent to post pictures online and to and to share that kind of information. And it seems like that's your experience as well, or what you've seen out in the industry as well. It is. And there's a couple sites I'm logged into. I've bought items before, and then I've gone shopping. And I thought, you know what? Maybe let's go buy something else. And then I don't buy it for whatever reason. I don't love how, and I'm not kidding, probably 30 minutes later, I get an email. Don't forget you know what that I didn't say you can that doesn't feel right to me. Now I know from a marketer's point of view, they want to be able to push me through my abandoned cart because that's what I am. I've abandoned my cart. I, I was I was shopping. But the fact that I wasn't necessarily logged into the site at that time, but they have the pixel and cookie to be able to connect my activities and then serve me that message. Every time I get that, I'm a uh, I don't I don't like that. It's a little bit of a tarnish to me against the brand that did that. I still like the product. I might like the brand, but there's something about that element of trust that I'm not loving. And when they want me to give them more data, I might not want to. And if we think about this in a B2B context and a B2C context, everyone has a user journey that we're trying to walk them through. It's about not pushing too far down that path and finding just that right balance to get them along the way where they will feel comfortable when they get a message from us. They're going to open it. They're going to engage. As we think about the pressure nowadays to connect with our customers and our prospects, it's a fight for the inbox. It's how many ads are we seeing all day long everywhere we go? We want that relationship to be strong. We want it to be a trusting relationship. And when you do these types of things where I'm taking data and I'm using it in manners that I I don't like, that kind of big brother creepy kind of factor, it takes a little bit away from that trust at each moment. Yeah, I, I can think back to one... Um... I guess I was in-house and I was evaluating that kind of a solution and people were like, well, say they hadn't emailed before. And it's like, oh, they have lists of emails that, you know, so they can reach out, you know, if the user had never provided an email to you, but had filled a shopping cart um, and they hadn't gotten to that phase. And it's like, well, what does that do to the user experience when suddenly you're emailing them and they've never given you their email address before? Um, and so you're right, is that's uh, that's a real, you know, it's, it's, it's a hard a thing to sell internally, though, because everyone usually is just looking at the, oh, this is going to increase our revenues by 2x, you know, however, however many things however we'll be able to recapture these users. But to your point, the trust part is harder to quantify. Um, and that loss of trust is often something people forget about in that calculus because it is hard to quantify. Um, and I think in your book, you also say here, this is another great quote from your book, to users, data is personal. Gradually sharing personal information with one another is how human beings build relationships. Intimacy is a function of disclosure uh, or for disclosure. Um, so, I mean, that's uh, that kind of captures it all there. In other words, like, you know, maybe say, hey, we can recapture this user or help them finish their cart. But if you don't have that relationship again, that just erodes the trust that the user has and as a result, they may not come back because they just like you. How did you get my email address? How do you have this information about me to reach out to me after I left the site and decided to shop elsewhere? If you think about the physical experience, you walk into a showroom or a store to buy something. You're buying furniture. You're buying a shirt, right? Really different. You're buying a car. Very different experiences. Well, if I'm buying furniture, oh, well, what are you buying furniture for? we're expanding our family or we've, you know what, the kids have jumped on the couch enough. It's time to move on. You might share a little bit at the moment because it's relevant right there. 
Now, if I'm walking in and they want to know my entire life history and all my kids' ages and all of my interests, we I just walked in the store. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine being bombarded with a questionnaire that asks all of that information or how already had that information and guesses and tells you, oh, hi, Jody. It's so nice to meet you. I see that you have, uh, you know, two girls. These are their ages and, and you have a dog. So let me make sure I show you the dog friendly couch and the one that will work great for your children. Can you imagine having that? Everyone would literally walk out and, and be turned off immediately. Again, that's sometimes what happens in the online world. We're asking for really detailed information. And we haven't built the connection yet. We haven't established the trust. And that is the human piece. That's what gets people to give more information, buy upstream, buy more products, refer your company. It's not the one time I bought a pair of shoes because you sent me the card for it. Revenue increased. Well, how do I feel about the rest of your company? How did my entire experience go? And am I going to buy more? And am I going to refer you? That, in my mind, is a very important piece that people need to think about. Marketers think of the intangible when they think about brand. They need to also think about the intangible when it comes to privacy. Privacy, and uh, and I think you you know, and the elements of trust and how it relates to data privacy. And you you gave an example um, about um, so a party, and I think in your book you were talking about somebody who is goes to the bathroom and looks. Uh, in the medicine cabinet and reading the pill bottles is more of a data privacy or privacy issue. Whereas if they take pills, it's a security issue. And so how are the two different in the sense of trust and the data uh, privacy context? It's a very real world example versus the security context. And how should um, privacy practitioners and other people think about that and the different aspects as they relate to trust? Well, we want to be thinking about what kind of information do I know? What type of information have I collected and how have I used and, and what am I going to do with that information? In the pill scenario, if I see that Susie, my friend, is taking XYZ pill, I, I collected that information, I'm not going to use it. I'm just going to put it in my brain. If I physically take it, well, now I have a security issue. If I think about in the data world, all the data that's collected is in different software in, in throughout a company. Some people physically have that type of information, which means then where am I, how am I protecting that data? We need to have data breach concerns. If I physically, someone's able to come and take all that data, now I have potentially sensitive information or information about my customers and I haven't properly protected it. It's important to understand the kind of data we're collecting and how we're using it. That's going to be the privacy piece. Then we have the security angle, which is protecting it and making sure that it isn't being accessed by people who shouldn't have access to it. And I think I think that's where um, we see on the for uh, unauthorized web scraping, a lot of companies struggling with, you know, um, thinking, well, gee, you know, and and regulators and and judges. We got that opinion last week in the uh, X case, um, which um, you know it's unfortunate, but uh, well, maybe you have a chance to talk about that a little bit later. But that, you know, there's there's a lot of data privacy implica implications when it comes to unauthorized web scraping and that, you know, you're telling an end user, look, we're only going to use your data in this way. It's going to sit here. You're going to give us your pictures and they're going to be here. And then you have a third party come along and grab that. There's also um, security issues in the sense of, well, um, you know, an abuse of the service or and, you know, how how uh, the, the site or the platform is trying to detect these issues. And so it seems that, um, you know, and how much information is being made public, um, either by the platform or by the um, by the individual users themselves. So can you speak a little bit to the difference between the two in, in the in the uh, scraping context? Well, you know, if I again, if I'm collecting information, what kind of information am I collecting and how will I use that? How have I disclosed that I'm in my let's say I collect information from a third party site, I put it in our database and I use it for my own business. In my privacy notice, how have I disclosed that I'm collecting data from a third party, how I'm using it and what that means to you? From a protection standpoint, literally where am I putting this data and who has access to it? So if I physically am collecting information 
I'm housing it in what type of database? And again, kind of thinking about the kind of data that I'm collecting might warrant different types of obligations. Is it sensitive data? Do I have geo precise geolocation data? Though that might be very different from, you know, my zip code. Now, both might be interesting pieces, but it's the what I'm doing and then how am I matching it up with other data points? Because most people who are going to scrape data are connecting it with other data points. It's other pieces of the puzzle that they're trying to interconnect to be able to paint a whole picture. Why? To, to either further sell. So are they selling it upstream or downstream? Are they using it for themselves? And then you have to think about the privacy and security risks along that whole journey that we just talked about. So now that brings me to uh, wanting to talk, just wanting to talk to you about another thing where uh, another problem I've noticed when I was in house and at other companies is sometimes you come across uh, and at conferences you come across this stuff is uh, a why not attitude about collection and use of data. We need to monetize this. You know, we're going to go out of business if we don't uh, monetize uh, this data that we have. And um, you know, if we can collect it, we can use it. Or if if we if the user gives it to us, we can do whatever we want. And I think that's changed a lot post GDPR. Um, but you know, I think on page seventy two, you were talking about um, in your book. You said um, it's a badly outdated um, concept and need to change. Companies that want to build trust with consumers will need both a mindset shift and a new process for how they manage the collection and storage of data. And can we talk about that kind of migration from the why not maybe post GDPR in the past 10 years to more of a, hey, this is a regulated um, space and, and people need to think about data in a very different way that just because you collect it doesn't mean you can do whatever you want with it. If I go back to our original conversation of sort of the stalking idea, right? Someone following and collecting all this information. I might collect all this information. Now, how, what am I going to do with it? And am I going to use it in a manner that will be a surprise to me? At the end of the day, companies are trying to, most companies are trying to make money. They're trying to sell something. And we're trying to convince that person we're a wonderful product and service. Along the way, we're trying to get our message to those people. And then once they buy, we have some data about them. The more data we have, the philosophy of many companies is then I can try and get you to buy more things. And some companies, the service has been free. It's been a freemium model in the software universe with the idea being, well, I gave it to you for free. How did you think I was going to have my operations? Of course, I was going to use your data. And for some people, they've gotten used to that. That's been, okay, if it's free, somehow they're using my data. But not all companies have adopted that philosophy. Some have said, oh, no, no, it's free because the freemium is going to pay for this. And I'm really just trying to get you in the door and get you to realize how amazing my product is and move you upstream. In, in my mind, if you're going with the philosophy of, well, it's free, of course, I get to use your data. With the introduction of GDPR and other privacy laws, that mindset is shifting where consumers are now understanding what's actually happening and not liking it. Or... If they're willing to do it, it has to be incredibly obvious this is what we're doing. There was a case years ago where there was a company, they were, it was kind of a clean up your inbox type company. It was free and they didn't disclose how in doing that service, they then were utilizing that data for themselves. And the philosophy was, well, it was free, everyone. How did you think we were going to do this? They didn't disclose it. Contrast that with a different organization that had an entire page dedicated to, here's what this means. We offer the service for free. Here's what you get in return. We do X, you get Y. And then the person can decide, I'm willing to make that trade-off or I'm not willing to make that trade-off. Where I think you're seeing people go is they're not willing to make that trade-off enough unless it is so incredibly valuable for them, which is a handful of companies, not the majority of companies. And I think we've seen a variety of smaller companies try and follow what some of the larger social media-like companies have been doing or some of the very heavy content-driven where it's been advertising-based, but that doesn't work for everybody. It doesn't work for those necessarily. We have a whole, a whole nother conversation on that. The idea, though, of it, it's my data 
is I think what GDPR really introduced. It's the person first, company second. And globally, it's taking a little bit of time, I think, to get to that shift. The companies that adopt that now will be in a better place because ultimately, I do believe that's where we're going. I agree. I mean, in the sense of where rights to be forgotten or other things that we've seen in Europe and and as we you know, the, with the Brussels effect um, that we're kind of living under where uh, kind of they're, they're at the forefront of some of these, um, I guess, revolutionary or co maybe common sense changes in privacy. Because you get back to the beginning of your book where you're like, if you had somebody standing next to you doing some of these things, or if you had you, you went to purchase something at a store and you decided not to and the person followed you to the next store in the physical world, that'd be very strange. Um, and so I think, uh, yeah, I think I think a lot of those common sense um, uh, changes are coming or we'll see more of that in the, in the next five to 10 years. Um, and now I, I think we're also kind of moving to talk about the ethical implementations of data collection, storage and usage. And I loved your example on page 75 of the babysitter where they want so much information about your children and everything else before you can even search to see if there's a sitter that's available as a parent of three children and, you know, trying to, you know, having to make meetings or, you know, attend a, attend a dinner at night for work, you know, sometimes you do have to get a babysitter. And it's so, so frustrating when you have to go through, you know, these sites that are just collecting all this information. It's like, I don't even know if I'm going to use you. And, and, you know, why do you have to know the exact birth date of my children? And that's the point you made in your book. It's like, I, why can't I just say I have a toddler, a middle-aged kid and a teenager? Um, why is, why isn't that sufficient for what you're trying to do? So um, I, I don't know if you had any thoughts about that and, um, you know, how companies are rethinking how much data they're collecting. And then I guess the ethical imp imp implications of that data collection and the, the other uses, because they're clearly not just collecting it just to collect it. They probably want to do other other stuff with that information. Well, the babysitting example, the philosophy is likely, you know what, I want to find a sitter who has experience with that age child. And not all sitters are great with children under five or are great with tweens. So let me find out the age. Well, let's design the site. I need to know the age. Then goes to the engineer, the website designer, product engineer. Okay, great. Here's how we ask the age. Nowhere in there was a privacy conversation. Well, hold on. So what's the actual goal? The actual goal is to match sitter with the child and making sure we have the right skill set. What's the concern of the skill set? Let's make sure we have someone. So to your point, David, of the range, well, elementary versus preschool, baby, that would have come up had you identified what's the real business goal with what could be the privacy risk, what could be a consumer turnoff, and how do we manage that and get everyone to where it is? People just focused on their immediate thought and went straight to design. Where we really need to start thinking about is in the privacy space, and this is true in the AI environment, cool AI tool, I want to go and use that, here's all this data, problem solved, I take data, input to tool, outcome comes. But I didn't think about all the risks in the middle. If we break it down again, what is the company goal? What is the privacy risk? How do we get you from point A to point B? And those are where those ethical pieces come out. It's understanding, well, what is the data that you're trying to collect or how you're trying to use it? And what can we do to still let you try and accomplish your business goal, but in the most customer friendly, most ethical and least privacy risky way? And and I mean, I'm sure you've been in these conversations where you have a product team and you know you kind of start with them and they kind of have one vision for the product and then... Uh, at the end, it's something very, very different, and the data uses are different. But yet, there's usually only one privacy impact assessment or one one trip, usually uh, a few days before launch, to your favorite privacy attorney to say, "Hey, are we doing this right? Is there anything we should be thinking about?" So, um, do you see companies kind of becoming more sophisticated and maybe trying to develop a product launch calendar or some sort of a process to? Uh, involve privacy and get some of these questions on the table uh, and, you know, questions about AI governance on the table and, and even cybersecurity for that matter um, before, you know, a week before launch, uh, before that you get to that point where everyone's like, it's Friday. Can you approve this over the weekend so we can launch on Monday? It definitely still happens. Uh, I see some companies with a more mature environment where it's really in the product design and 
at the beginning and going all the way through their life cycles, we still have a lot of room to go. I do see many privacy programs that have privacy impact assessments and that thought. It's not necessarily connected, though, to how they're actually running the operations. And we have a lot of room to go in a maturity model of being able to incorporate, here's the privacy risks in the marketing, as well as product and other, any other part in the business area to be able to to bring those two pieces together. Now, I love um, uh, something else that kind of your your book touched on was, uh, st- you know, strat- t- thinking about strategy for fostering a culture of ethical data practices within organizations. And I harp on this a lot sometimes. And I love your quote on page 104, that companies need to know where their data is stored and, and how its confidentiality, integrity, and availability are secured and regulated. Uh, at the very bottom of the page, you said data is collected to be used and how you use your customer's data is perhaps the most critical aspect of building trust. And so, um, I, you know, I mean, I think I think the where data is and how it's collected, it's hard enough now in the scraping environment to think about all the different places externally that somebody may try to exfiltrate or grab data or an API or uh, a web page or even, your, you know, um, your CEO's bio page. Uh, and additionally, now you have the internal situation, which has always been difficult um, because you might have a new engineer product team. They spin up something. Who's telling you that there's a new table in the database? Who's telling you uh, that there's a new um, system uh, in place that's using data in a different way when you're sitting inside of as the privacy attorney responsible for some of this stuff, or at least supposedly the point of contact that's supposed to be managing some of these things? So can you talk to a little bit about what you've seen and and how to foster that culture of ethical data practices where people are the engineers or the product managers are thinking, hey, look, we need to talk to our best friend, the privacy attorney, to let them know that we've just spun up a new database here. We have a new system. We have a new training set for our AI model. And uh, here's the here's the components of the training set. And what should we be thinking about? The companies that have some process in place are the ones that are going to be able to best capture these. And you have to be able to understand all of the data in the organization. So to kind of the quotes of the pay of the book, it's you, you can't secure anything if you have no idea what you have and building trust is all about how you use the data. So you have to understand what you're collecting, determining how you're using it. Then you determine what's next. Those companies that understand all that and have built in at those initial stages, I want to do something new with my data. I want to use this new tool to help me do something. They can have assessments. They can have questions. They can have different kind of milestone gates to be able to review all of that. Those are the companies that are able to answer those ethical questions. Is there any issue with what we're doing? No. Great. Proceed. Is there an issue? Yes. You have this particular concern. Let's talk through it. Like in our babysitter example, let's identify what that risk is. Let's talk through and come up with what the plan can be. Then if necessary, further documentation, maybe for some privacy compliance laws. Otherwise, you can proceed because you've identified what the risk is and then you've figured out what your mitigation is going to be. I do always recommend documentation of some variety in a data inventory, a privacy impact assessment. The burden of proof is on you, the company. If there's no documentation, there's no proof that the conversation was ever had. No, that's right. And uh, another thing, I just while we're on that topic of um, kind of managing these systems, and I think in your last podcast, you you um, you said one of your favorite phrases in privacy was "Do what you say, say what you do." And um, and I forget Justin had one, but I'm trying to remember how he phrased it. it was something about scaring. Scaring is caring. I think caring is caring uh, on the cybersecurity side. And, um, you know, one of the things I think about a lot of times is, you know, the do what you say, say what you do is privacy controls. And so, like, who's monitoring the systems that are already in place? Because usually people are chasing, okay, we worked on this product launch. And then it's forgotten for a year and it's chugging along and an engineer comes along and they're like, hey, wouldn't it be great if instead of deleting IP address after 30 days, we kept it for a whole year? And you have a retention schedule now that's out of sync and maybe externally you're disclosing that you're only keeping a, the IP address for a particular transaction for 30 days. And so it's almost like a privacy drift where you were in compliance with what you were saying externally and what you're doing internally. But now suddenly um, because of um, engineers, maybe people not paying attention, 
product managers having different goals, uh, they've kind of caused things to slide out of compliance. And so have you seen companies trying to manage that and come back and look at things they've deployed to make sure they're still compliant and either by using controls or auditing processes or what's your uh, experience um, there to ensure that their data practices are still what they thought they were six months ago? I have. I've seen a lot of this recently, actually. We like to call those privacy program assessments or a gap analysis. And I've seen many companies want to do this. It's a good re it's good for a variety of areas. You know, if you think about a tune up or just any part, we go every year for a health check. There might not be anything physically wrong, but you want to make sure you know because you can't always see what you don't know. The same is true in a privacy program. We might think we have all the controls in place, but do we know if they're actually working? If we have a policy, up oh, we said we had a policy, but are we doing whatever the policy actually says we're doing? That's where a, an assessment, an audit, a review comes in handy. You're able to actually look at what is happening in the business against what you thought was happening. Then you're able to make any adjustments. These are, and depending on the size of your company and the size of your program might warrant where you start. Perhaps you start with just one particular area. Other companies want to look at a holistic size. Both are great from wherever you are. I've also seen some companies... Maybe they did a really great GDPR implementation. They might have done a good CCPA implementation, and then they've done nothing since. Well, we have a lot more laws since then, and whatever you did then might not be actually accurate now, and that could have been three people ago as well, because people change, businesses change, processes change, systems change. I mean, I haven't met a business that is stagnant and has done nothing, which is why it's a really important idea to do some level of a review and making sure that you fix anything that you find and right size it so that it works for you for the next however long you'll go without testing it again. Now, how how hard is it? I, I often say this, but I think it's very difficult for companies to grade their own homework. And so um, in the sense of, you know, I think um, it, usually if the company's large enough, they have an external audit team. But if they're not, what are some strategies for companies either to, to, you know, looking at a scraping issue or looking at how they're handling their privacy obligations to engage with uh, third parties to, so that they're not grading their own homework. Because sometimes that can be politically difficult to tell your uh, rock star brought in half a billion dollars last year that their privacy side of their house is not so good um, and that they need to do things a little differently. Um, and sometimes that that message is better delivered from a third party. But I wanted to, you know, try to maybe get some of your insights in that area and how uh, that also is a strategy to foster a culture of ethical, you know, data practices by using external people to help you do that. The external piece, I think, is really helpful for a variety of reasons. One, I often hear that an internal team needs the third party to actually convince the other people that there's something wrong. And that's always really helpful to be able to offer those resources. The Benefit of a third party is they're also working with a lot of different companies, which means they're able to bring not only evaluating your organization, also the best practices of what they're seeing. They're able to connect all of those dots and help elevate your program or help you do something a little bit differently. And you know, you're right on the idea of grading your own homework. It is helpful to have someone on the outside who also has probably a specific method method, right? Repeatable framework to be able to come in and perform that review and assessment, give you a prioritized roadmap. Everyone internally is going to be a little bit clouded as to what is important for them. From an outside view, if you're looking at a privacy program and you're looking at here's the risks, someone on the outside can say, here's why you want to focus on this area first, as opposed to this one over here. And that's, that's sometimes hard to set those priorities um, because I think third parties or external they work with so many different clients. Like I, I, you know, I see this in my own practice where, you know, you kind of get a sense of where companies are struggling and and can kind of say, hey, you know, what what are you, what are you doing for geolocation? How are you handling it? Um, because you see uh, two or three other companies that are maybe getting um, questions from regulators about that particular kind of issue. So um, I think that's another advantage to um, kind of engaging third parties to work on some of these issues. I wanted to turn to talking about nurturing trust through transparency and accountability. And um, in, on page 126 of your book, you say, treat your customers' data the same way you treat them in person, with respect. 
Don't sell it and um, then have them dictate their preferences. Create a transparent data use policy, communicate it to customers, and ensure that you, your contract workers, and third-party vendors abide by it. When done properly, this can yield a significant competitive advantage. Can you talk through that a little bit and kind of elaborate on the advantages of, you know, kind of nurturing trust through that kind of transparency and accountability? Well, sometimes I think people go with the idea of I'll ask for forgiveness. If I collect all this data, and again, if I don't see my customers, I think many companies forget that there's actually humans on the other side buying product, but they're humans buying products. We're not kind of hope we stay at the human level of buying product as opposed to the AI robots coming to buy the product. So we're going to stick with the humans, which means if you were in person, you know, think about what happens when you go to a restaurant, you would look someone in the eye. That interaction is really different than when you just text someone. And that's that relationship building. Well, if I take the data, which feels intangible, and I put it in a pile and I just sell it off to some third party. And then I say, well, hi, customer, I sold it. And I put it in my privacy notice. And then I'm going to let you opt out of all of it. I didn't necessarily, I didn't treat that person's data with respect. I did what was best for me, the company, as opposed to you, the individual. Then how easy did I make it for the individual? I have to know that you did this. I have to find a privacy notice. I have to go find some form. Will you honor that for everyone or only honor that for certain laws? I live in Atlanta, Georgia. I have no state privacy law and, and a handful of federal laws in certain sectors, which means effectively I have less privacy rights than many other states like Jody in California. Mm -hmm. Will you honor me or not? And if you don't honor me, then we're back to you just are utilizing my data, which is in the benefit of you. And while there might not be a privacy law, consumers overall, they don't necessarily know that. They see updated privacy policy emails. They see updated privacy banners all over the place. They see the news. They just think there's new privacy protections in place. They're not reading the nuance of those. And I don't think that is where trust comes from. I think trust comes from doing what is in the best interest of the customer to be able to give them the products and services that will help solve their problem or fulfill the need that they're so excited to have, the more I feel that you use the data in a manner that connects with them, I'm going to trust you more. I'm going to buy more. I'm going to refer more. And then when you ask me for information about me, I'm going to give you more first-party data. Guess what you do with more first-party data? You sell me more things. That's right. I mean, in your book, you say data may be a commodity, but the people it represents aren't. And treating it as you would treat them builds trust and encourages them to share even more information about you. Information that used responsibly and creatively can be good for business. And that's great that tie into the first party data and how you can actually get more first party data if the if your customers trust you. Um, are, are there things, best practices for organizations that you can think of to enhance that kind of transparency and accountability? Because it's a hard sell internally um, sometimes when people are just saying, oh, we need to monetize, we need to monetize. What do you, um, what, you know, what are some things off the top of your head that you can think of that, you know, maybe um, for a privacy practitioner in, in, in house or um, advising clients that they can kind of um, try to encourage people to work on transparency and accountability? From a transparency perspective, it's looking at your privacy notice. And then depending on the kind of data that you're collecting, do you have any other just-in-time notifications? And if I think about that privacy notice, is it easy to read? Is it buried in the font? If you're truly scraping data and, and selling it, is that said? Is it said, I collect this kind of data and then we're selling it to third parties? Or is it just much more vague, where the average person would never be able to really understand what's actually happening. And then from the idea being, how can I convince from a monetization standpoint, do some math, understand what is what is the value of the company for selling this data? There are more regulations that are going to start restricting the ability to do that. And then start thinking about, well, if this, where do we operate? What's the kind of data? What's the potential privacy law horizon? And with what I'm doing now is, and where the future is going, how does that align? Would I be better doing something different in taking my resources and building a monetization track that is a different manner? 
we are seeing some monetization tracks where people are opting in to sell that data. They know what is actually happening. Now, I think there's some interesting scenarios where you have to think about getting into kind of ethical concerns and making sure it's not a pay for privacy point of view, because I think you can have some interesting ethical pieces there. But you're going to see different models with people trying to test where to go. And the reason for that is the conversation we're having. It's around privacy. People are more aware of what's happening. More laws are in place that are restricting what can and can't happen with that data. And ultimately, privacy is now not just this compliance activity. It's actually a fundamental piece. It's an enabler. And in the business environment, B2B, I see this showing up significantly. Companies are not able to close deals without good privacy programs. What's happening is company A is asking company B, are you doing anything else with my data? Are you selling it for other purposes? Are you using it for yourself? This is showing up a lot more in AI tool conversations. The reality is it's the same conversation, even if it's not an AI tool, it's just a third party conversation. And in that situation, you're finding more companies saying, I don't want you to do that. Carve my data out. Here's my audit capabilities for that. That to me is a shift of its company first, not you, not, you know, me, the customer first as the company, not you, the vendor I'm buying. That will start to, we start to see things in the B2B space. And I think they'll start translating down into the B2C space as well. Yeah, I'm sure, you know, you're, you're talking about this made me remember um, uh, several years ago, the FinTech explosion and a lot of the FinTech companies thinking that they were exempt from Gremlich Bliley and some of the, um, you know, basic financial regulations. Um, and I think, um, uh, you know, we both probably have seen, you know, where deals have kind of been scuttled because the privacy side of the target is terrible uh, and their data handling practices are terrible. And it just doesn't, it doesn't make sense to take on that risk uh, for the acquirer. Um, and so, um, I mean, I think that that's a great point to say, hey, there is a long-term, if you're thinking about an exit strategy for your company, or you're thinking about um, um, selling it to a different or partnering with somebody, they could very well ask, well, what are your um, practices around how you how you handle uh, user data, how you treat data, where you acquire data from, and uh, could put a real drag on a deal uh, or or cause it to collapse altogether if um, if it's if it's uh, if you haven't been doing that the right way. I have a hundred percent seen exactly that deals gone nowhere because they didn't have their privacy pieces in a row. And I've also seen the reverse where companies are looking for additional investment. They want to sell. They want to make sure that they have their privacy house in order. And sometimes we're called in to help do that exact privacy program assessment we just talked about to get that company ready for sale or investment. Now, how um, now that we're kind of everybody for the past year or so, and some of us have been dealing with this for a lot longer, the um, AI and how to use deal with automated decision making and and um, those types of technologies. Has any of that changed your thinking on trust, or um, has it made it even more heightened? In that, um, you know, I think you know from what I've seen, uh, there was an article today, for example, that was talking about AI systems possibly deceiving end users and deceiving the testers to get around um, certain scenarios or, or shown to be deceiving um, uh, testers when they're playing games or that kind of things is being tested as these systems are tested. And so um, I think what, what, you know, has any of this changed in the past year with this uh, AI revolution and people realizing that a lot of businesses have been using a lot of these technologies for five years, 10 years, and they just didn't really give them very much attention. And now they're everyone's learning about training sets and they're learning about scraping and, and that kind of thing. So what are your you know perspectives on how that's changed in the past year? I think the element of trust has increased exponentially. I think there are an entirely new group of security threats that are here for AI, just completely different ones that we didn't necessarily have from before. Your, your testing example is one of those, but you could also kind of do poison data. You know, if you think about the model that you have and now you're going to put bad data into it and now you're making decisions based on bad data. And before we might've had that, but the risk to that happening now has elevated. The idea of trust though, I think is even more important. If you're going to utilize AI and you're going to have an output I need to be able to trust that output. 
I have to look at what the model is. And then I need to understand if I give you my data for our transaction, or you just got my data for marketing for somehow, what are you doing with that? Again, can I trust you? Now, it might be a more advanced tool. The same concept exists. What type of tool are you putting it in? What are you doing with it? And what is that output and how will it be used? I think companies also, it's important for us to think about the privacy elements for sure from personal information. Companies should also be thinking about the company information. Think about in two sides. If you're a B2C company, you still have company data that you want to be mindful of. Think about the B2B data though on the other side. I might have revenue data about you, financial data. I, I spoke with a company a couple of weeks ago. They have very little personal information. They have incredibly sensitive company information, financial information about the companies. I don't want my company financial information getting out there for my competitor to be able to see or my investor to be able to, to see or you know potential people that shouldn't have access to that. Trusting the system, trusting the security, and trusting how the model is going to use the data and its an output, I think is incredibly important. Yeah, I've seen, um, yeah, that's that's uh, so right. I mean, I've seen situations and I've talked to companies about this and said, hey, look, just because somebody says, well, we, we, we're not keeping your data. Well, you know, and you see a lot of these agree in, within the agreement saying, hey, we might use your data or our relationship to improve our service. Well, does that mean that they're using your data to train their model? And your partner may be taking and they're saying, oh, your data is your data, but what about the learnings from my data? And um, that's something that I think a lot of people in the past were like, okay, you're going to use uh, my transactions with you to do bug fixes and to fix problems with the interface that you're providing me when I use your tools or something like that. But when people sit down and say, wait, that could also mean you're using my actual data, my transactional data that's very valuable, hard won, um, to possibly build a model that then you might sell to your competitors or use that to improve my competitor's performance. Well, hold on a minute. Um, that's a different kind of um, uh, it's a different kind of data use that's really not maybe allowed under that very loose provision now that people are using data that way. But in the past, people would never have thought that you know uh, you know that the the that that kind of provision meant anything more than just bug fixes. Um, and I don't know if you've seen that, but um, that's something I think, you know, it goes to that trust issue. Um, you know, well, now your agreements, well, they they might mean not, not they may not mean what you think they should mean um, when uh, the data use could be to train models or other things. I completely agree with you. So nothing extra special to add, just everything you said times two. Then um, I guess another another question for you is just thinking about. Um, just generally, and I, I love that you guys do this on your on your podcast. Um, what are one or two takeaways or things people should think about? Maybe one on the, in the privacy side, and then one for companies dealing with scraping and um, trying to figure out how they can protect their their either their company data or their end users from from scrapers that that you can think of based on your practice. So in terms of kind of good privacy best practices, I would say is to have a program. And, you know, we talked a lot about auditing, testing, reviewing. Somehow programs need to be dynamic. And I firmly believe programs are unique to each size company and the kind of data that's actually happening in that company. Having just an assessment tool without the policy or process doesn't really work. Having an assessment that you haven't looked at in a couple of years also doesn't work. Having an assessment template that no one takes, not very helpful, which means you need the policy and the process and you need to have that cohesive piece of a program and knowing who the people are in the company to make all that happen. Who are the, the, the core players on this privacy team and this AI team? I'm seeing significant integration between AI work and privacy work. My takeaway would be having a program, reviewing that program, making sure it's flexible and dynamic, and it's it's actually getting reviewed and working. And then in terms of scraping, you know, we've we've talked about, I still believe terms and disclosures are good and we should have them despite particular court opinions. So I would offer what are the rules of the road for your company and, and having that in place. And then I do think that there'll be, and there are some sophisticated tools that are out there to try and help some of the tech savvy folks 
to be able to kind of figure out is, is that data out there and, and to kind of have like listening ears on and understanding what kind of data you have and where else might it be used and how did those companies get it? So having a pulse in the industry to understand where that data is going is, is important. I mean, there it used to be in the automotive space and it was always known where data was coming from. Oh, data came from here, here, and here. Well, it, that was known. That was the industry speak. Be familiar with what your industry speak is because that can also help identify where those holes might be and who might have access to that data. And one one final question, I think this is usually missed, and um, but I, I like to talk about it a lot, is the financial. A lot of companies are very constrained. They're you know maybe they're in a downsize downsizing cycle, and the privacy teams are you know being asked to do more and more, take on AI, take on other things. If um, and, and I I've found that sometimes hiring a third party outside party is was more palatable than maybe bringing on headcount internally. And so if you're sitting there and you were, say, advising a per one solo privacy practitioner in a, in a large company and saying, well, how would I even justify getting the budget spend to do some of this stuff or to bring in a third party to help me do an evaluation for where data is um, or to, to help people understand these trust issues, perhaps prepare a training? What would your approach be to do that? Well, Think about the risk if you don't. The risk if you don't might be lost sales. What's the cost of, what's an average sale? What's a few sales that would cost you compared to the cost of an assessment? If you were to have a data breach, what might that look like? If you were to have any kind of privacy incident and uh, or your vendor might be using your data that you don't know. So to the scraping conversation we just had, reviewing your contracts and understanding, can your vendor use the data in any capacity would be a really great starting point. And here, what if your vendors could utilize your data? What could that risk be? My hunch is that if you were to look at any one of those, the benef the cost of the assessment is well under the risk and the financial cost to what any of that might be. And we of course have the potential for fines and regulatory risk. For many companies that might be a lower risk you might be a company that isn't going to fly on the radar, but your customers know that. And if you were to ever have any kind of breach or incident, the cost of all those outside people is a lot more than the cost of an incident. And then, of course, we just have trust, which we've talked about from the B2B side and the B2C side. So tying it back to that element of brand and trust and user experience. Well, Jody, thank you for an amazing hour of uh, privacy uh, talk and talk about your book, Data Reimagined, um, a must get for any privacy practitioner, AI practitioner, cybersecurity practitioner out there, or just business person that wants to know more about what they should and should not be doing. Thank you so much for talking to us again as well about uh, unauthorized scraping. And hopefully we can have you on again to talk a little bit more about some of these court cases that are coming out that are um, not, you know, not going so well. But um, really appreciate your time. And again, thank you so much for being on the Mitigating Unauthorized Scraping Alliance's webcast. Thank you. Thank you.